So good morning, everybody. I know. I'm, I'm sorry. We're having a little bit of trouble with the microphones, so you're going to have to listen to me shout for just a second. Um, but we're going to have someone go and fix that in just a minute. Um, so sorry, sorry about the sound quality for just, just a minute. We're having a little bit of um, problem with that, um, but hopefully we'll be able to get that fixed soon. Um, in the meantime... Um, I'm so excited to welcome everyone to the sixth annual Prison Awareness, Prison Education Conference. Sorry about that. Um, this is the third year that I've been involved with this conference, and each year it's one of the highlights of my year, so I'm so excited to be here again. Mm. Um, this conference is unique in that it brings together such a diverse representation of the community around such an important issue that really impacts everybody. Um, this year is no exception. And we will begin by hearing two very different perspectives on the role that restorative justice can play in the legal system as an alternative to the traditional punitive system. We believe that it is always important to be looking towards the future for new ways to ensure that justice is provided to everyone. And I'm sure that we can all agree that no one has a monopoly on the correct way to administer justice. Then, after lunch, we will transition into a discussion of what is being done within the current system to promote individual and community growth. At the heart of this improvement is, of course, education. And we will hear from many individuals who have been personally involved in prison education efforts. Our final keynote speaker is Gigi Blanchard, a former juvenile delinquent turned activist who offers a unique perspective into the inner workings of the justice system. She is here to talk about how she finally escaped a cyclical battle with incarceration and her transformation into an advocate for justice reform. Once again, I would like to thank you all for being here, and it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Aaron Baker, Chair of the Department of English. Without his support, none of this would have been possible. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Baker. Thank you, Bridget. And I want to thank Corey also. I'm sure most all of you know Corey Wells, who's an important part of the program in this conference. So I'm only going to talk briefly, because you're, you're not here to hear me talk. So I'll keep it short. That's why I wrote a few things down so I don't ramble on. Um, I'm really honored to be here today to welcome you to the sixth annual Prison Education Conference. Um, as chair of English, you can imagine uh, I have a lot of stuff to do. It's a big department, hundreds of faculty, thousands of students. But not everything I do is equally important or important to me. Um, some of it's more important. Some of it seems like it matters more, like it's more meaningful. And, and supporting Corey and Bridget and, and this program and this conference is one of those things that I kind of feel like, yeah, that, that counts, that matters, that's making an impact on the community. Um, when I think about the, the purpose of the English department, I mean, what are we supposed to be doing? And I need to reflect on that sometimes. I get so wrapped up in the daily... Uh, responsibilities that sometimes I need to think about it. And the main thing we do is teach, uh, help students learn, uh, give them access to ideas and help them communicating those ideas. I mean, that's the most important thing we do. And that's what you all are doing in your work uh, in prison education. And when you think about the people you're teaching in this program, they need learning as much as anyone. They, I think you could assume, have not had ac much access to education, many of them. So it makes the teaching you do even more important and their learning even more important. So I just want to salute you and thank you for doing this work that is clearly important to our society, important to the people involved, um, to be part of a conference about justice and the power of education to change lives, I mean, that's something to really be proud of. That's something that you can value and is worth doing. So, welcome. And I hope the conference goes really well. Thank you so much, Dr. Baker. Um, and I would also like to say thank you to Dr. Elsie Moore from the School of Social Transformation. She couldn't be here today, but the School of Social Transformation doubled their contribution to the conference from last year, and we are so, so grateful. 
Um, next, please join me in welcoming Dr. Corey Wells. Uh, Corey has been the faculty advisor of the Prison Education Awareness Club for many years now, and it's largely a result of Corey's passion and dedication that ASU has continuously expanded his prison education efforts. I know she's been a role model for a lot of us in this room, and we really appreciate her efforts. So please welcome uh, Corey Wells. And I don't know if you introduced us by your name, but that's Bridget Nicoletti. She is the president of Peace this year. We're also really lucky to have two former um, peace officers with us who graduated last year, Jessica Fletcher and Natalie Volan. They both are here. Um, Natalie flew down from Colorado just for the conference. Um, it's great to have them. They, they really set a precedent for for. for Bridget, who has done a phenomenal job in particular this year, also for our other officers, Kim Chi Pham and Madeline Ordway, who have served throughout the year. Um, so <clears throat> I came on board this program five years ago. It started six years ago. It, it started by virtue of a very forward-thinking and compassionate and empathetic uh, teacher at the universe at the <laughs> university at the penitentiary of New Mexico in Santa Fe, she had this great idea for a pen project wherein people in well, it, we now call it administrative seg, I guess formally, but it's solitary confinement. It's being locked down 23 hours a day, and she came up with this very forward-thinking uh, program to have them write when they feel like it. There are no assignments. Um, creative works, poetry, um, fiction, and, and we've even gathered a lot of this into a journal, um, which we'll have a demonstration copy of out on the table. Um, fiction, creative nonfiction, novels, plays, lots of rap music, um, some of it really very good rap music, actually. And she um, thought, well, you know, I could, do, I could find some call college-level interns who could do this program with me. And they can um, get internship credit while they respond to this writing for these guys. And it'll give them an outlet to the real world, outside of their little cells, and, um, and they'll grow as writers. And so she, start, she tried the universities in New Mexico. They weren't biting. So she cold called the uh, Arizona State. She talked to Professor Joe Lockhart, who started, who took her up on the idea and started this program. Um, and so from it have come all the classes that we now teach in person at the two state prisons in Globe and Florence. Um, unfortunately, uh, the person who started that program, Michelle Ribeiro, has retired from the penitentiary, and the incoming uh, education supervisor there shut the pen project down. Um, this very semester, about three weeks ago, um, amidst a lot of crying by a lot of people there, actually. Um, and he did that. We're still not sure of the reasons. Um, some of them given were that it interrupted with vo interrupted vocational ed, which doesn't make sense because the guys that are, most of the guys who participate don't do vocational ed because they can't even get out of their cells to learn any trades. So uh, we're not sure what happened really, but he was against the program all the way along and he finally rose to a position of supervisory power and shut it down. Um, so yesterday morning I received a letter, even though they can't participate anymore in the program, uh, I received a letter from one of the Penn Project writers whom we've worked with for the last year and a half. Um, I'd like to read it to you because I do believe education has an impact, and I think it's about the only thing that makes the really big difference about recidivism, but that's not its only purpose. These are human beings, and everybody who learns something is growing, and people matter now. They matter, and they, and they grow, and they have the capacity to grow till their very last breath. All of us do. So here is his letter. This is Daniel number 33. That's not his prison number, that's his pen project number. Part of the Santa Fe group run by Ms. Weed. Due to administrative cutting the program here, I wanted to write to show my sincere appreciation for all, for you all and for what the pen project program is doing. I am a firm believer that whoever shut down the program here due to, quote, lack of demonstrable decrease to recidivism is dead wrong. I started with a few pro poems back in October 2015. They were my first poems. Being locked down 23-7 is hard. We can use all the help we can get to pass time. Well, those three poems turned into an avalanche of words on paper. 
You all can testify to the large amounts of work I was submitting. For those of you who are working with Joshua, it's comparable. Lots and lots of stuff uh, working with Joshua from ADC. I went from never writing anything creatively to submitting a dozen poems in several different styles, multiple short stories, and even a few plays. I've also written a 650-page fantasy novel and started a crime novel. I say this because this is all due to the Pen Project. Because of this program, I discovered something I truly love, writing. I'm a writer, exclamation mark. I probably never would have discovered this without the Pen Project. Plus, the information I've gained from you all has been priceless. I know man many of you that read, read my first piece and my last piece have seen the growth. It's been massive in just one year. Studying your feedback to my work, I was able to not only better the submitted piece, but also better myself as a writer. You've educated me. You've been my teacher, all of you. And it's a proven fact that the real cure for recidivism is education. I want to emphasize how important you've been to me as a writer and general student of life. I feel I've been given a key that unlocked vast potential I didn't know I had. What you do there matters. It's more than just editing convicts, poems, letters, and stories. You inspire us to be and do better. I can't be the only one who feels this way. You have given me hope for the future, and I guarantee I'll be published one day. Whatever the book, I'll mail a copy to you all at ASU when it happens. Smiley face. It might be a while, though. I was and still am inspired by all of you at the Penn Project and have been honored to be part of the program. It being ended here was devastating to hear and truly broke my heart. But I will honor the knowledge you've passed on to me and continue to write, read, and generally strive to be better. Thank you for everything you've done for me and everything you continue to do for other convicts. Sincerely, Daniel number 33. Um, as I've interfaced with the educators at the prison in New Mexico, I have um, been just amazed and appalled at the variance of kinds of attitudes toward education. Um, I have been so blessed here. I, I don't know any of the political leanings of the Arizona Department of Corrections educators and wardens and administrators. Um, are. I don't know their political leanings. I don't care. What I do know is that they are all humanitarians. They all care deeply about the individuals that they serve um, in the prisons and the communities they serve outside the prisons. They are wisely and common sensibly um, committed to safety and security. That's, that's a given. But they are deeply committed to the general welfare of everyone under their care. Um, from the two uh, prison education supervisors, Dr. Metcalf and Dr. Weaver, to their supervisor, Tim Lawrence, to his supervisor. Uh, all of a sudden, that one, Mark Jones, <laughs> was going to slip out of my, my head. But, and to all of the teachers I've interacted with, and even most of the corrections officers. They are a wonderful group here in Arizona. That's all I can say. I've not had a bad experience yet. And... Uh, Oh, I did hear one offhand comment by one corrections officer with very bad grammar, but I didn't really count that one. <laughs> but no, these people are absolutely fabulous. I, I feel blessed. And when I talk to, you know, the people from New Mexico, and I just say, gosh, I just can't imagine, because the people I work with are so wonderful. I've never had a bad story to tell. So I thank you all for being here. I, I enjoy our camaraderie. I enjoy our partnerships. I look forward to everyone who's speaking at this conference and I thank you. Thank you so much. And that concludes all of our opening remarks. Um, so all that remains for me to do now is introduce our first keynote speaker. Um, Judge Lilia Alvarez um, presented at our conference last year as well. And she was just starting the program in Guadalupe, the teen court program then. So we've invited her back to talk about its progress. Um, and Teen Court members have heard over 50 cases since January 2015, which is a, it's a vast amount of cases. Um, on July 11th in 2016, Guadalupe Teen Court received the National Recognition Award for Innovation by the National Association of, of Counties. 
um, for being the only teen court in the entire state of Arizona held in a library setting with a judge as their leader. Um, and the, the approach that Judge Alvarez has chosen has been just remarkable. Um, she really has tried to bring in such a restorative approach. She really cares about the students that she works with and it shows so much in all of her work. So we are honored to have her back again. Um, and we would love to have her come up after just one second. I've just seen do uh, Dr. Elsie Moore come in from the School of Social Transformation. Um, so if she would like to come up and say just one word or two, we would love to have you. Thank you so much for your support. Um, so uh, Dr. Elsie Moore and then Judge Alvarez, sorry about that. Hi, I, uh, you know, I came over at the time I was supposed to, Bridget, <laughs> but uh, Bridget and, and Corey uh, came by my office uh, I guess back in the fall, to tell me about the conference, and I was totally excited. I was not aware of the organization, and uh, I was very excited by the knowledge. Um, this is an issue that's very close to my heart personally. It's not something that I do research in, but all my life I've been concerned about what happens to prisoners. That is, and I, ha I am aware enough to know that we've gone back and forth as to whether uh, prison should be just punishment or should it also include rehabilitation. I've, I believe rehabilitation is an important function. If we never want to see these individuals again in prison and we want to keep our communities safe. It's also the case that I'm the mother of three black boys. And this issue became even more important to me with the birth of my first son. Because you probably know uh, the non-white men are overrepresented in the prison system. And given other dynamics in our society, they often end up in prison because of poor choices and also because we respond differently to different demographics for, you know, poor choices. And so, you know, as I watched, you know, Black Lives Matter and all the talk about uh, what one should do uh, in order to prevent uh, young black men and old black men and women from dying uh, as a result of encounters with the criminal justice system. I think back to what my husband and I did when our kids were very young. As soon as we thought they were old enough to learn the lesson, we start teaching it. That is, how do you interact? with the criminal justice system. What do you do if you get pulled over for speeding? And, you know, I can tell you the lesson, but you probably already know it. But my boys got it before they were six years old, and it was reinforced. At any rate, going back to what you do, um, the importance of education, I can't applaud that initiative more because many of the young people and old people in prison really never had a good shot at life. And being educated and having the opportunity to be educated is critical to who they are when they come out of prison and what they pursue. I remember listening to a TED talk by uh, a man who had gone to prison when he was like 16 or 17 years old. And he started, um, and I can't remember the circumstances, but he started journaling. And he would ask himself questions, and then he would answer his own questions. And he, writing was a critical part to his growth as a person. And when he came out, he initiated an organization. And so as his TED talk was to tell people, you know, about how he got to where he is, the good he's doing in the community. 
as a result, really, of having been in prison. That is, he never had the opportunity to just think and write about it and talk to himself about it. I think he was one of those who spent a lot of time in solitary confinement. It's also the case that I am the director of a unit, the School of Social Transformation, that has justice and social inquiry as part of its uh, programs, as one of its programs. And I just want to say that this, the student organization um, is really doing what we advocate as part of our scholarship. That is, that we make a, a positive difference in society wherever we can make it, given where we are, as in the process of our development as scholars. So with that, I'm done. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore. And I'm sorry I didn't see you come in there. Um, I know I'm sure you did. I was too busy listening to Corey's letter. I'm sorry about that.